The challenges of our time call for a common global response through education. More than ever, our capacity to deliver on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development depends on our positioning education at the top of the political agenda. In September 2022, the UN Secretary-General convened the Transforming Education Summit in response to the triple-headed crisis heightened by the COVID-19 pandemic, a crisis of equity and inclusion, a crisis of quality and a crisis of relevance. Leveraging the report of the UNESCO International Commission on the Futures of Education, the summit sought to mobilize ambition, solidarity, and solutions to transform education. Key summit outcomes are the following. Multi-stakeholder engagement at the country level, building on the national statements of commitment submitted by member state governments. A vision statement from the Secretary-General which sets out foundational principles to guide the urgent, deep and fundamental change that is needed to transform education. This vision statement is a manifesto and urgent call to member states and the global public to join efforts towards transforming education and elevate education to the top of high-level political dialogues, including the Summit of the Future in 2024. A global movement for transforming education, with youth as central actors and agents of transformation, as manifested in the Youth Declaration. The call to action on educational investment, investing more, more equitably and more efficiently in education. Five global initiatives to leverage greater financial, technical and political support for country-level implementation. Greening education to get every learner climate ready. Connecting every child and young person to digital solutions. Addressing the crisis in foundational learning among young learners. Transforming education systems to enable all crisis-affected children and youth to access inclusive, quality, safe learning opportunities and continuity of education. Advancing gender equality and girls' and women's empowerment. In addition, a global commission on the teaching profession was proposed at the summit and is being established. As outlined in the Secretary-General's vision statement, the SDG4 High-Level Steering Committee will be responsible for following up on the summit's commitments by integrating the summit outcomes into SDG4 coordination, monitoring, and implementation efforts. The SDG4 High-Level Steering Committee will ensure the effective follow-up to the summit and demonstrate powerful leadership, bold action, and collective determination to transform education. At the Transforming Education Summit in September 2022, the Youth Declaration was launched, presenting the collective vision, demands, and commitments from youth on transforming education across the globe. This declaration is not just words on paper, it is the future. We are innovative problem solvers who start an opinion to power and whose collective actions will change this world. The youth of the world have made it clear in the Youth Declaration and will continue this process today, which will inform a broader global youth initiative. To help shape the Global Youth Initiative, which will be led by the SDG4 Youth Network, regional youth consultations have taken place across the world, highlighting local needs for support and action. Y sabemos qué es lo que necesitamos de nuestra educación para estar preparados para los desafíos del futuro. A lot of people have been refugees or displaced in my country, and we hope that we can use this platform as well in order to um, provide sustainable solutions to those people. When you say investment, it doesn't always mean have to mean financial. The young people appreciate being visible and having their inputs being taken into high consideration. How can we? manage budgets and, and put financing into more useful ways to help support education. Um, how can we partnership, make partnerships between the private and public sector? Um, and how can we really use our resources and um, activate as youth activists to uh, make these initiatives happen and create the change? You are the change, you are the change, you are the change, you are the future, you are the future, and 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 you are the future.
واحلامكم بتصنعوا اللي مستحيل انه ينصنع وبالاخير بدي اقول لكم انه من المهم جدا Peace is one of the most important components of education. The Global Youth Initiative will be launched on the International Day of Education on January 24, 2023. Without engaging young people, there is no shared ownership. Without shared ownership, there is no commitment. Without commitment, there is no transformation. We need to turn words into action. Let's join forces to continue growing a global education movement. We count on all of you to help us make this happen. As our world faces crisis after crisis, education is suffering. For too long, the voices of those affected most have not been heard. That's all changing. As young people, we need to see this vision, believe in it, dream big, and actually work towards achieving this reality. Are we ready to put in the work that it needs to create this transformation? Over the last three months, almost half a million young people from over 170 countries and all regions participated in global, national, and grassroots level dialogues, both face-to-face -face and online, to develop a common vision towards transforming education. Called the Youth Declaration, it's based on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and emphasizes that education is a fundamental human right, a global public good, and a public responsibility. Through this declaration, young people everywhere are driving change, pioneering innovation, and mobilizing peers and decision makers to act. The advisory committee had an incredibly strong voice from the youth student movement. And we have seen more young voices come into those rooms. And so our commitment to you is to get many more into the rooms as we can. Transformer education, c'est un pacte nécessaire entre générations pour reconstituer des sociétés durables. School should be a safe space for everyone. We have to achieve gender equality. We cannot talk about education in the 21st century without climate education. I want to see all the children with and without disabilities learning together, playing together, and enjoying together. And we cannot talk about SDG 4 without inclusion. Uh, we cannot really achieve SDG 4 if we leave refugee and displaced youth behind. We need to teach kids how to deal with themselves so they can know how to deal with the world. We need to improve education systems to align with tomorrow's labor market needs. Transformative education looks like equal resources for all schools. We need everybody in our communities, both local and international, to put in work and ensure that there is enough political momentum and commitment to transform education. Transform the education, transform the globe. Young people, everywhere, are paving the way towards a new education system, where all learners are empowered to reach their fullest potential. It's not only about protecting the right to education everywhere and for everyone. It's also about transforming learning. I urge everyone here today to support the youth declaration process.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. Welcome back from the parallel sessions. I hope you found them as lively and informative as I did and insightful. I think it was so great to hear about the experiences of the different stakeholders, the teachers, the donors, of course, but the people who are directly working with children, with girls, as we heard in the last session here in plenary A, just hearing about their experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, brings it home and, and helps us understand the issue even better because, as we've heard from one of the panelists earlier, these girls are not just numbers, they're not just a number, but they are stories of people who are directly impacted by child marriage, which then affects their education, of course. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce the next an important and final session of the second day of the high-level financing conference, which is building on the Transforming Education Summit. It's, of course, a critical topic of what happens next. We've talked about the issues, the solutions, what happens next. Now, I was lucky enough to host the Transforming Education Summit at the UN General Assembly last year, which was convened by the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, in the wake of the largest disruption to education with the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. This Transforming Education Summit was an important conversation about how we reimagine education in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think that as part of reimagining education, it's important to prioritize the education of children in the forgotten crises and emergencies, especially on my continent of Africa. All children, ladies and gentlemen, have the right to an education, and those in conflict zones and crises must not be left behind. So we can talk about reimagining education all we want, but if there was no education to start with, then what do you reimagine? Re so that's why the work of education in emergencies and protracted crises is so important and must be brought higher on the international agenda. So without further delay, please welcome to the stage the co-moderators for this session. Very pleased to have two young voices moderating this session. Linda Yunis from the Global Youth Initiative and an SDG4 Youth Network representative from Uganda and Hussein Ahmed Mohammed, ECW Youth Constituency Representative from Somalia. Linda and Hussein, please come to the stage. Linda and Hussein are gonna take it from here, and they'll be leading this session. Please give them a round of applause. Greetings, and thank you so much, Margareta. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nakai Vale Linda Yunis. I am from Uganda, the leading refugee hosting country in Africa, hosting about 1.5 million refugees. I am representing the Global Youth Initiative and the SDG4 Youth Network. Welcome to this session on building on the Transforming Education Summit. Now, the 2022 Transforming Education Summit presented a great opportunity to elevate education on top of the global political agenda, inclusive of education in emergencies and protracted crises. Before we get into the panel discussion, I would like to remind you of three important initiatives. One, the launch of the Education in Crisis Situations, a call to action, that call to increase access, quality, equity, and the inclusion for the 222 million children whose education has been interrupted and are not learning. Two, the Youth Declaration for Transforming Education, the first document of its kind, and the outcome of months of consultation with over half a million youth from 170 countries. It outlines the collective vision, proposals, and commitments from youth on transforming education including the demand for decision makers to eradicate all legal, financial, and systemic barriers that are preventing all learners, particularly migrants, refugees, and internally displaced youth from accessing and fully participating in education. Three, the Global Youth Initiative. 
This is the first small stakeholder global initiative aimed at ensuring meaningful youth engagement and leadership in education policy making. It was collectively designed to take forward the demands identified by youth from seven regions as key priority areas in transforming education. It will be coordinated and led by the SDG for Youth Network. Before I introduce my co-moderator, Hussein, I would like us to watch a message from Mr. Fania Giannini, the Assistant Director of Education at UNESCO. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, emergencies and protracted crises were at the heart of conversations during the Transforming Education Summit last year. Governments, United Nations and all other multilateral agencies, teachers, young people, civil society, and all stakeholders came together to jumpstart action. They focus on what to do, to do urgently and what to do differently, most importantly. Five months later, the verdict is clear, we cannot waste time. We meet today in the aftermath of a natural disaster that has caused horrifying loss. Military attacks on site across the world are devastating lives and culture, in some cases even targeting schools. A war against women and girls is depriving millions of their fundamental right to education and erasing them from public life. This is why the call to action on education in crisis situations was launched during the summit and signed by almost 40 countries now. It's both an alarm bell and a cry for human solidarity. We cannot let it remain a nice piece of rhetoric. We need the tangible actions where they matter most on the ground, in classrooms, in the experiences of teachers and learners. We need more financing for sure, urgently, including through Education Cannot Wait, whose role is more and more essential than ever. UNESCO is acting to maintain the momentum and follow up on our promises. I call on all partners and donors to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Giannini. Assist Assistant Director General for Education, UNESCO, and my co-moderator, Linda. Hello, everyone. I am Hussein Mohammed from Somalia. I'm very pleased to be here and serve you as your co-moderator today. My country has experienced three decades of protracted situations of conflict, instability, and environmental risk. When I was nine years old, my home was destroyed by severe flooding, causing me and my family to be displaced and my education disrupted. There was no provision for education in emergency during that time, and I witnessed many other displaced children without safe place to learn, forced into jail labor. I will share more about my work and situation facing learning and education in emergencies in Somalia, but first let me introduce our panelists joining us in this important session. Joining us today we have Minister, Minister Deng, Minister of General Education and Instruction, South Sudan. We also have joining us Ms. Laura Frigenti, CEO, Global Partnership for Education. <laughs> Mr. Michael Messenger, President, CEO, World Vision Canada, with Niall Deng, Review okay. with Niall Deng, Review G, Education Council member from South Sudan. We also have Mrs. Patricia Dens, Director General of Swiss Agents for Development and Cooperation. And last but not least, we have Mrs. Maki Katsuno Hayashikawa, UNESCO Director, Division for Education, Tony Teddy. It is important to know that all panelists have four minutes maximum to respond to their questions. It is essential that all panelists keep to this timing for the smooth running of the session and the high-level financing conference as a whole. We thank you in advance for your cooperation on this point. I would like to ask the first question to Minister Deng. In relation to ECW support to South Sudan, what action is the South Sudanese government taking to further improve the quality of education, especially for girls and children with disabilities? Thank you very much. I Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to appreciate the tremendous support that education cannot wait. 
and its donors have been providing to South Sudan. This support has been extremely well received and has made an, a huge impact, helping tens of thousands of girls and boys across the country to obtain a quality education and to realize their full potential. Yet, needs are overwhelming and we must do more. As many as 2.8 million South Sudanese children are still out of school. Some of them are living in pastoralist community and hard to reach areas. But a significant group of out school children are girls and adolescent girls. As poverty, child marriage, and a wide range of social cultural factors continue to impede their education. We are facing also an acute shortage of qualified teachers, especially female teachers. Currently, we only have 13% of our primary school teachers and 10% of our secondary school teachers female. So there is an urgent need to increase the number of women in the teaching profession. We have made some progress, good progress, in recent years but most of the schools still lack basic facilities and equipment. Approximately one third of our classrooms are open air or under trees. This poses a major challenge for us because it leads to significant loss of teaching time, especially during the raining season. As much, we are extremely, extremely happy that education cannot wait multi-year resilient program in South Sudan is renewed. This new project bridges the humanitarian focus with the long-term efforts and objective of flagship program. We are fully committed to ensure its full implementation. We are doing the best we can to improve our education system and to reach more children, especially girls and adolescent girls and children with disability. Last year, we have managed to increase our national budget for education from 6 to 12.5% of the national budget. Well, in this increment in domestic finances has helped us to employ more teachers and improve their pay, which made the teaching profession more attractive. Our pupil our pupil to qualify teacher ratio currently stand at 86 to 1 at the primary school level. For us to further increase the quality of education that we provide and to be able to reach children, we must urgently increase the number of qualified teachers. And we are committed to equip them with this teaching skill and content knowledge that they need to excel. We are currently in the process of upgrading both the pre-service and in-service training, notably by establishing more teacher training institutes across the country. We need at least 30,000 qualified teachers in the coming years but based on the excellent cooperation that we enjoy with Education Cannot Wait and GPE and so many other international partners, I am confident we are going to succeed. Transformation of education requires innovative ideas and here teachers are the game changers. Therefore, we must equip them with necessary tools to inspire their learners and deliver quality education. In fact, we act now, things will change. And we can overcome challenges, such as safety issues in schools, limited learning spaces, girl education, and learners with disability. We deeply appreciate the support we are, we are being provided for by the Education Cannot Wait to our children in South Sudan. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Minister Deng, for your insightful comments.
It really is critical that governments and other stakeholders recognize and prioritize the specific needs of the most marginalized children during emergencies. And now to Ms. Friganti, I like building on what we have heard from Mr. Deng. How do GBE and ECW work together in contexts like South Sudan to help build lasting, resilient education systems? Thank you, Hussein, for this question that is actually very timely, uh, I think, because as you have heard from Minister Deng, as she was describing the situation in South Sudan, South Sudan is really facing a double challenge. There is, on one hand, a strong drive to build a stable and uh, uh, transformed, I would say, education sector. And on the other hand, there are so many dimensions that still uh, you know, speak to the world of emergency. You have refugees camps, you have internally displaced people, you have children that have been out of the school system for many years. And so you really need to move on a double track. And this is where uh, I think the role for ECW and GPE to work together comes. Um, ECW does all the excellent work that relates to this bringing these children back into the system somehow by providing immediate uh, education services and support to conditions that are particularly difficult the refugees, the internally displaced people, children in conditions of stress, uh, and so on and so forth. And GPE, at the same time, works in parallel with government structure to think about building the system and putting it in place. And it's very important that the two things go on a parallel track, because we cannot wait for the uh, emergency phase to be completed and to be finished before we start thinking about what is the education system of the future that the country wants to build to create the society that, uh, you know, the, the respond to their vision. So in the specific case of South Sudan, uh, but the situation that Minister Deng uh, described unfortunately applies to many countries uh, in Africa and in other continents. So it's really, uh, you know, a, a dramatic situation that the education sector is facing at the moment. In the case of South Sudan, GPE has given a grant of 41 million that obviously is helping South Sudan reduce the number of out-of-school children by 15%. But at the same time, uh, you know, they have requested uh, 10 million in accelerating funding uh, to mitigate the impact of floods in the education system. And on this particular amount of resources, we are working very closely with ECW to make sure that this is coordinated and actually combined and tops up the resources that they are already uh, you know, bringing uh, to the table. This just to give you an example, but another one is the very recent uh, earthquake uh, in Syria, where uh, we were both working, but really in the aftermath of the earthquake, we really decided to join effort and to coordinate to provide, uh, you know, badly needed support to a very large number of children that uh, were already living uh, in situation of great duress. And I could bring another case, for example, Ethiopia, that I have recently visited, where there are certain parts of the countries that are still, uh, you know, in really leaving the aftermath of the war and where ECW is really doing some phenomenal work. At the same time, the government is thinking about how to bring these almost 4 million children that dropped out during the COVID and then war period back into the system. So as you can see, the complementarities are clearly there. And I have to give credit to all our teams, uh, you know, uh, in the countries that are working together to make sure that this coordination really reflects the real needs of the partner countries that uh, so much require help in difficult situations. Thank you, Mrs. Mr. Frigenti. Ensuring all partners work effectively together when crisis hit is so important. Before I hand back over to Linda to introduce our next panelists, I would like to share a bit more about my personal experience in facing, in this, in facing defending education in emergency in my country, Somalia. Somalia has one of the highest numbers of displacement globally. 
The, humanit the, hum the humanitarian community estimates that there are 2.9 million internally displaced persons ac across the country. This is on top of 1 million people who have been displaced since 2021 due to drought. Four consecutive rainy seasons and have failed, a climatic event not seen in the last four years. Although ECW, UNICEF, and education partners are working with the Minister of Education to provide learning opportunities for children displaced by drought and conflict, my country still has one of the world's lowest proportions of primary age children attending school. The primary net attendance ratio is estimated at some 30.1% for boys and 21% for girls. IDB children in Somalia face even more challenges, as well as being more at risk of being denied their right to education. They are also rarely able to access other social basic services, living in vulnerable settlements, at risk of forced evictions, climate change, lack of sufficient water, health care, and protection challenges and gender-based violence. In my experience as a teacher with youth organization Teach for Somalia, many children suddenly stop attending school. When I ask their parents what happened to the children, they tell you that they had to go in town and start working for them to cover the basic life food of their families. This is extra dangerous as children who do not attend the school can be targeted for recruitment and use dynamic conflicts. In my experience as a teacher, I therefore know and know as well as making sure every child can access the quality education. We must also, we must also focus on, on refugee and IDB children's life outside the classroom. We need to look at the child's whole life, what's happening in the home, are they experiencing abuse, do they have enough money not to be forced into work, are they experiencing, are they, do they have sufficient food and water and shelter? As you have heard many times through this conference, around the world, 222 million children and adolescents around the world today are affected by the horrors of war, conflict, and displacement, and are desperate to learn. To make sure, we, to make sure every child access their right to quality education, we have to tackle all the injustice they face in, the, in their lives. And now I'll hand back to, over to Linda to introduce for our other esteemed panelists. Over to you, Linda. Thank you so much, Hussein, for sharing your beautiful story. I think it's inspiring to have your voice in this space and on this panel. Um, Michael and Neil, what is World Vision and the Refugee Education Council doing to realize the test education in emergencies call to action and the test youth declaration for transforming education? Well, thank you, Linda. Uh, really, we're doing three things. First, in light of tests, we are trying to listen and learn. Second, we are making space for key voices. And then third, sometimes we're just getting out of the way. And I'll explain each of those in just a moment. Uh, but in light of the uh, test calls to action, uh, particularly the youth declaration with a rich list of, of areas to consider, uh, the manifesto from the Refugee Education Council, for example, the call for holistic approaches to education, gender transformative education approaches, and so on. Uh, at World Vision, what we've done is we start by looking at our current programming and asking, is it matching those requirements? Is it matching those aspirations? Um, and the good news for us is that many of them are. I had a chance not long after the uh, uh, Transforming Education Summit to visit some of our programming in uh, West Africa, in the country of Mali in particular. There we have a program with Plan International and Save the Children funded by the Government of Canada called Imagine. And the focus is that it's an education program in a fragile context, a conflict-affected area, focusing on the agency of girls to access education and address barriers that are keeping them out of school. Includes inclusive education, accelerated classes, catch-up opportunities as well. But most importantly, we had a chance to sit down with a number of these learners uh, under a tree and hear directly from them, girls and boys who had been uh, implement, uh, part of the program, and had a chance to ask them some of the same issues that came up during tests. And we were encouraged by what we saw and what we heard. Uh, of course, we have, uh, still have gaps in our programming as well because we need to look at where we're going in the future. We have more work to do, particularly in areas like inclusion around disability in some of our programs. Uh, but we continue to be engaged in cross-sector partnerships to enhance our work. So that's what we do when we listen and learn. The second is giving space to key voices. Uh, World Vision Canada is really privileged that we are able to host the Refugee Education Council. Uh, 
to make space for those who are affected to be at the table giving input into key decisions, providing a platform, and it has been a rich experience for all of us. And so with that platform, sometimes it's up to us to get out of the way, and I think I'll do that right now and introduce Niall Deng, who is part of our Refugee Education Council, and you can take the bulk, the remainder of our time. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, good to be here, and thank you, Michael, uh, you know, for passing on the megaphone to me. Uh, my name is Niall Deng. I grew up in Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya, and now attend college in Canada. And uh, the Refugee Education Council brings together a great group of 15 incredible young advocates uh, who have lived experience in forced displacement and as refugees. And they come from Afghanistan, they come from South Sudan, they come from uh, Kenya, they come from Uganda. Uh, they, you know, they're based all across the world. And um, the Council advised Canada on the Together for Learning campaign, which is a three-year campaign to advance refugee education. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think uh, five ways that the Council is advancing, uh, you know, the Youth Declaration, uh, which came out of test. One is the Youth Manifesto, which Michael mentioned briefly. So the Youth Manifesto is a call to action uh, for global ed education decision makers to prioritize education in emergencies uh, and protracted crisis. And it has a very big focus on gender equality, on inclusion, on psychosocial support, uh, and it was actually, you know, a resource document for the Youth Declaration. Uh, the other way as well is that uh, the Refugee Education Council is working to rallying other uh, global decision makers. Uh, so last year, uh, Canada hosted the Together for Learning Summit, where the Council uh, played a key role in, you know, uh, uh, organizing the event, and we were able to engage with decision makers from across the world on issues that affect young displaced people, especially the right to access education. And then the Council also brings together other refugee voices that are not part of the Council. As I said, the Council has 15 members, but we have, you know, events where we bring together refugee advocates from across the world who are not part of the Council to listen to them, because uh, you know, refugee is not a uh, you know, homogeneous group, so they all have different experiences and try to bring on board as many voices as we can. Uh, and then the other way as well is amplifying local voices. Young people are already leading the way. They are solution makers in their communities. Uh, and uh, one thing the council brings voices of young people and, and share their work is, for example, when we, had, when we released the Youth Manifesto, we you know, released uh, an anthology where we share uh, incredible stories of young people who are working in their communities as solution makers, designing solutions for education, uh, for gender justice, and to ensure that you know this peace in their communities. And then uh, the other one is addressing barriers that prevent young people from being here. Uh, yesterday we all watched the video. Those voices were silent because they are not in the room. They all have incredible stories to share. Uh, they all have incredible experiences to bring here. And myself as a refugee advocate, I don't want a seat at the table if other young refugee advocates do not have a seat at the table. I don't want a seat at the table if my community do not have a seat at the table. And just to close up, uh, I think the key takeaway that I want leaders to take away from this is that myself, Hussein, and so many other refugee advocates who are in this room, uh, who have experienced and lived this in forced displacement, when we come to share our stories here, we do it because we want you to see the power of education. We want you to see how education has transformed our life. And we want you to ensure that all children have access to education because it's the only tool that can help them build more, better futures for themselves and their communities. So please, hone our stories, hone our resilience. It takes so much struggle, it takes so much suffering, it takes so much to be here. Hone our refugee teachers, we heard from one from Uganda yesterday about the work they do. Let's make sure we take action. How many more conferences will we have before we take action for education? We need to do it here, we need to do it right now. We need to make sure that we put together the resources needed to transform education for 222 million children. And when it comes to youth engagement, let's get away and let's you know, uh, get rid of to the tokenism within the youth engagement spaces. What is the point of having young people at the decision-making table when you all come to table with predetermined mind decision? What is the point of saying that you want young people to be at the driver's seat when you, give them a fuel that, when you give them a vehicle that has no fuel. Uh, we need to make sure that young people are included at all points throughout the decision-making process. And this is something that the Refugee Education Council is working very hard on. And um, again, uh, you know, you, world leaders are failed on so many things. Please, let's not fail on education again. When we think of the education crisis, we don't think of decision-makers in this room. We think of young people like Malala. We think of young people like Pashana. When you think of the climate crisis, we think of young people like Vanessa who are doing incredible work in their communities. This is an opportunity for us to show leadership, and let's do that. And then the last one is that uh, we, need to, we don't need to set up more youth advisory council. We need to set up funding for youth-led initiative. We need to fund youth movement, feminist movement. We need to invest in youth network and youth coalition that are doing incredible work in their communities and that are leading the way. 
And as a young person who is very worried about my future and the future of my 60 billion who live today in Kakuma refugee camp, I don't think I just need a seat at the table. I actually want the entire table. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, Neil. He said, I don't want to sit on the table if other refugees are not at the table. Thank you so much for being the voice. I don't want to call them voiceless. They have voices, but are we listening? So thank you so much for highlighting first the challenges refugees go through, but most importantly for calling on the decision makers to have refugees at the decision making table. Thank you so much. Miss Danzi. Switzerland committed, I think, about 35 million Swiss francs yesterday to Education Cannot Wait. Why is Switzerland interested in funding initiatives like Education Cannot Wait? Why? Thank you, Linda, for the question. And I can assure you that it's even more. Actually, you heard yesterday the, the pledge of 35 million, but we also have, of course, an engagement with the partnership, the Global Partnership for Education, and building into our programs, because we believe so much in education, altogether it amounts about to 200 million a year that we have uh, on education every year, because we believe in it, and Switzerland is a country, a lot of success um, that has built uh, in Switzerland is built on its educational system. So we know that without education, there is no uh, development, there's no economic development, there's no social development. And so we try to build that also in, in our cooperation programs and our development uh, altogether. Now, I often ask myself during crisis, why is it that education is underfunded? Why is it that we don't immediately speak about it, although many choices are made around education? It's maybe because we have all received it. We take it for granted. Before, in a panel before, someone said uh, that all the people sitting here, we are here because we received education. So we need visibility. That's one of the reasons why we fund Education Cannot Wait and the Global Partnership, because education needs a space. It has to be put in and on the table together, of course, with the people that receive it, but also the one that give it. And so that is an interesting um, also construct if you have visibility for the topic. And uh, with uh, Yasmin, but also with Laura, we also have leadership. You need leadership in education. You have um, a topic that is there, but you need to have people who drive it. And so that's another reason why uh, we are funding it. And then uh, we are public, uh, public funding. Now, what the challenge that the world puts to us, how can we combine it with other uh, pots of funding? And you have seen yesterday, we are trying to look at new mechanisms, uh, innovative ones, to get more funding for education. Not only public funding, but also private financial institutions, Switzerland, is full of it. So uh, our task in the next four years is to bring more of this. We saw yesterday the Zurich Cantonal Bank uh, that has an interesting model. So everyone interesting in it, please uh, have a look at it. It's a very attractive one and can be interesting for other countries uh, too. And uh, lastly, Geneva is a great platform to put education, especially education in emergency, together, the different actors. What we also like and why we also fund education um, cannot wait is because we have here ac actors that can bring the, this nexus, the emergency, but also then the long-term um, development part and the peace part together. And we can be here and have a convening organization because we have seen you put a lot of very interesting new dynamics um, to the topic, and we are inspired by what you do. And we can frankly also learn as development actors um, how we can do better. The discussions uh, I have had personally uh, with South Sudan, but also with other countries here and other actors, and inspiring also youth participants, we can do better, always. So if we have convening powers, uh, that bring us and force us to think differently, that is also helping us to become better donors, better agencies, and be more connected to the real needs and um, bring the money there where it's needed and where it's spent wisely. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ms. Danzi. We indeed need money to truly transform education in emergencies. I will share briefly about some of the work I'm doing in Uganda to ensure that the 222 million children we are passionately talking about access quality education. Well, I work with adolescent girls in a Key Valley refugee settlement, most of them being girls with disabilities, because I recognize that aspects of gender and disability compound to force girls in emergencies into further marginalization, affecting their access to education, but most importantly, retention in school. So what am I doing? The issue of period poverty is one of the reasons girls in emergencies are not studying. Unfortunately, most of us are not talking about it. But just imagine, you are from South Sudan, for example, and you, are, you come to a camp in Uganda. All you have on yourself is a piece of cloth, and then you start your periods. What do you use? Just, pay, just imagine that, you know? And then you are expected to go to school and learn. How? How do you do that? So what I'm doing is training girls in emergencies to make their own reusable sanitary pads. That way, they're able to access school but most importantly, stay in school. We oftentimes emphasize, or oh, this number of girls have enrolled in school, but how many of those are actually safe in school and learning? If we do not address issues of period poverty, we are going to lose many girls. Many girls are going to drop out of school. So that's one of the things I'm doing. Number two, to realize that TESS, Youth Declaration for Transforming Education, I raised funds, I did write uh, a proposal to Urgent Action Fund to raise money to provide sexuality education to girls in and beyond school, as well as girls in emergencies. Because I strongly believe that with comprehensive sexuality education, we'll be able to address issues of child marriage and teenage pregnancies, which factors are impeding girls from fully participating in fully accessing education, but also growing to their full potential. And I believe that with our interventions through the sessions I'm having with girls in Akiva Refugee Settlement, many of these girls are able to make healthy life choices, but most importantly, to stay in school and learn. Again, if education is not intersectional, it's not education. Over to you, Hussein, for the Q&A session. Thank you, Linda. We have the questions over here. The first question is to Minister Deng. How can young advocates, communities, and civil society support government's efforts to improve education in emergencies? Thank you very much. Uh, I think, um, first of all, I wanted to say it is time for us to say we heard you, not that we wanted to include you. I think we heard you, and it is important as a family which is working towards one goal, to work together to improve education and quality education in emergency and conflict crisis. I think all the stakeholders in South Sudan, the experience we have last year was when we brought everybody on board, we brought civil society, we brought the, the traditional leaders we brought the parliament, we brought the executive, we brought our partners, we brought teachers, we brought students, we brought lecturers, and we were asking ourselves, how do we improve education in this country? And amazingly, I think even the voices of the children were so loud of what they really want to see in education. So that's what made me to believe that children have solution to their problems. So we cannot speak on their behalf, but they can speak by themselves of what they really want. And I think in that process, we discuss a lot of things, and I have seen the strengths where everybody said, I take this responsibility, and the other one will say, I take this responsibility. The parliament is saying, okay, we'll discuss about the budget. The executive is saying, the governor say, I'm going to take the lead and I will be the director of the school. And he started visiting the school and where they also uh, had a law that was passed to ban early child marriage to promote girl education. And working together with them, what the traditional leadership, who is actually with the communities uh, need to do 
is for us to educate them. And our program in South Sudan is making sure that these traditional leaders need to go to school so that they don't just sign, but actually write their name to value education so that they can be the protectors and promoters of education within their villages. So I think there is a strength in working together, whether it is advocacy, whether it is resources, whether it is technical, and I believe that we can do better. Recently, we appointed a young man to run our institute, and in one month, I could not believe how much he has put in there as a creative person and mobilizing everybody, the teachers, the students, and everybody, and working together in the institute, and I was really, really happy. So I think there is a strength for doing together. That's why education cannot wait. When I see my sister, Yasmin, she was like, she's the grandmother, she's the mother of education, and she's everywhere saying, you can't leave 222 million children out. We must empower them so that they can also be responsible citizens to contribute. So I, I believe in power of working together. I believe that we need to work as a team. I believe that we need to work as a family. We need to divide tasks to each other. And I'm sure when we put this together, we will get to the bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you to Minister Deng. And now my other question is to Neil. Neil, why is it so important that young people who have experienced displacement themselves are part of the decision making on education in emergencies? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'll just answer in one sentence. I think refugees are teachers, they're doctors, they're professional when they flee their countries. So they're people who are actually working on the very same issue that you're trying to find a solution to. So why didn't you listen to them about their experiences? about what they have gone through, about what they actually want. So the main reason why refugees should be included in decision making, especially when in, regard to education, in regard to education, is because they're already you know, leaders in that sector. They're already leading the way. So they just need them to have a seat at the uh, other table. Thank you, Neil, so much. And now, to you, over, over to you, Linda. Thank you so much, Neil. Again, we cannot have conversations about refugees without having refugees in the room and at the decision-making table. That's something I, we need to take home, all of us. If there's anything we need to take home from this conference, we can't have conversations about refugees without having the refugees in the room. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that. I would now like to invite Ms. Maki from UNESCO for her remarks. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But before anything, I wish to first thank Linda and Hussein, who did an excellent job in moderating this extremely important session. Well done. I'm also very grateful for all the commitments and ambitions that were shared by our panelists highlighting and touching upon the four pillars of the call to action on education in situations of emergencies and protracted crisis from the perspectives of a government, a donor, partnerships, and the civil society, and of course, youth. This session was of particular importance for the education emergencies community at the aim to pave the way forward the commitments that were made at the highest level, highest political level in New York last year in September. Let's not forget that the summit was a mobilization at an unprecedented scale, bringing together countries, UN and multilateral agencies, teachers, youth, civil society, private sector, and a variety of other stakeholders to elevate action. It set in motion critical thinking through two lenses, what to do urgently in terms of the post-pandemic recovery, and what to do differently, paving the way for transformation. I've been saying this many times already, but can never be enough to remind ourselves that the world after the summit, we really have no longer, we cannot no longer be doing business as usual. This is simply not an option for us today. 
To further put our panelists' contribution into context, allow me to recall the test follow-up strategy that sets out efforts under five pillars. First, the most important task now is to support countries to achieve the commitments set out in their national statements, which presented us with incredibly rich basis for action. This is how and where the ultimate success of, summit, of the summit will be measured. The second pillar of the follow-up is to ensure that the transformation of education will be a key component of the process leading to the SDG summit this year and the summit of the future next year. The third pillar is about advocating, operationalizing, and scaling up the five global initiatives launched during the test. The fourth pillar is improving financing for education, and that's why we're here both in domestic budget and, of course, international aid. We must bring education and finance ministers to, to the same table. Mobilization goes beyond cross-sectoral partnerships and enhanced collaboration, including ECW and GPE. And finally, the fifth pillar is sustaining the global movement. We need to sustain the energy and momentum we've ignited by continuing engaging all our partners, especially the youth. And this brings me to recall that we also have the Global Youth Initiative launched on the International Day of Education on 24th January. The SDG4 Youth Network will ensure that young people participate and lead actively in education dialogues and policy making. I call on the international community to support this pioneering initiative by, for, and of the youth. The global movement is also about teachers. We must strengthen existing mechanisms, systems, and tools supporting and empowering and protecting teachers, especially in emergency and protracted crisis situations. I must reiterate that the success of the summit follow-up will depend on our ability to reach out beyond the education sector. Our panelists have also pointed out education transformation simply cannot happen without transformation in and together with other sectors. It's also critical that we take a whole of government and whole of society approach to transforming education. Now these two days, I personally have been very inspired and my hopes have been raised listening to powerful messages and pledges being made that we can indeed take forward the commitments made at the summit even or especially in situation of crisis. Where there's a will, there's a way. We need to stay mobilized as education in situation of crisis is an issue that can no longer be seen as something temporary or outside the traditional educational sector work. It must be integral to our overall efforts and responsibilities in education, in planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation, and of course, in funding for education. As part of this mobilization, UNESCO will continue to support the 222 million dreams campaign beyond this high level foreign, uh, fund, fund, forum. Let us work together to keep the fire for transforming actions burning. We cannot lose a mineral penny to reinvent, reinvent the wheel. We must act now. Thank you very much. And now let me hand over back to Linda and Hussein. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Maki. Um, I'll let it hand over to Hussein for his remarks, and then I'll give mine, and we'll conclude. Thank you. Thank, thank you, for Mrs. Maki, for those inspiring words. You and all the speakers on this panel have made a powerful action a powerful call to action and, and the importance of prioritizing and financing education in emergencies. We as youth, as youth, as youth organizations, as young people at the grassroots and on front, and, and on front lines at this, at this crisis couldn't agree more. Every day we, wit we witness the first hand of the devastating impact of the, of the, of the world's most, most vulnerable children. If the wars made at this, at this panel and are, not, are not delivered, the time for war is over. We need money. We need action. We cannot fail 222 million children caught up in crisis they had no part in creating. We cannot leave a generation behind. Thank you. Over to you, Linda. Thank you so much, Hussein. We cannot leave the 220 million children behind. I would like to add a few points on what my colleague Hussein just mentioned. And my call to action is one, support the Global Youth Initiative and implement the Youth Declaration for Transforming Education. That's the only way we are going to guarantee meaningful youth engagement in education policy making. Number two, in order to leave no child in emergencies behind, inclusive of children with disabilities, 
you need to say that transforming education for, in, for disability inclusion call to action, that way we'll support the 240 million children, inclusive of children with disabilities, to access quality inclusive education, because education is a human right. And number three, we need funding for education. This is a financing conference. Now that means when you give your money to Education Cannot Wait, Education Cannot Wait will be able to collaborate with youth-led initiatives. Neil here was talking about funding for youth-led initiatives. It's true, it's us who are directly working with communities. We are the ones working with the 220 million children, adolescents, and youth you are talking about. So with funding from ECW, we will be able to lead the initiatives at the grassroots. Money must trickle down to grassroots. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to those of you that have joined us online. Thank you for asking your questions, for tweeting and commenting. And let's get to work. The 222 million children, youth and adolescents are counting on you and I to keep their dreams alive. We can't fail them. We shouldn't fail them. Thank you so much. Marcy. Brilliantly moderated, Linda and Hussein. Thank you so much. Please, thank you so much. Gosh, they did so well. Linda and Hussein, well done for leading this session on transforming education. Brilliant, brilliant.